So how many people were here last week? You just raise your hand. Okay, good, good amount of you. Um, I want to have some recap time, some dialogue. I want to test your memory right now on what we talked about. Um, I'll give you some help. I'll get the neurons firing a little bit to help you get, remind you where, where we were uh, last week. But we talked about the Apostolic Resource Center. Okay? And uh, you can go to the next slide. This might spark your memory. We talked about uh, the typewriter and old technology and the need for new technology and moving with the times. And we compared that to the church that is ever growing and changing. The message is timeless. The, the actual idea of communication, the word, is timeless. The gospel never changes, but our expression changes. And we're in the midst of a major expression change of church. So just one or two people, raise your hand, tell me something from last Sunday. I'm putting you on the spot right now. Something that we talked about last Sunday about the resource center. About, the, about what we talked about. Thanks, Joanne. Thank for the clarity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I did. But adding a little bit more information to that. Bob. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. The music of the ages stays the same. But yeah, the way we output music, the way we release music, that's... That's evolved. That's changed over time. Somebody else. Yes, Renee. There, there you go. Yes, community services. Yes, so we talked about different branches of the church. We talked about the fact that the church was really meant to exist in community and in home-to-home, -home, you know, expression, life, but we talked about different areas of what we want to use this building and facilities for, so community outreach, community networking, an arts center, uh, an equipping center, um, social justice initiatives to be able to come forth and be planned and, and executed through here. I did want to clarify one thing, I, I just in case, in case somebody was here last week and, and might have misunderstood what I was saying, because um, I talked a lot about how church was meant to exist and thrive like in the home, and we want to start planting house churches in this region, and we want to start you know, facilitating that kind of stuff. I, I don't want anybody to think that we're eliminating this time of corporate worship. Having a time of corporate worship and prayer and, uh, and getting in the Word is absolutely vital for a region. Like That's really healthy. It's really important that that the church that is hopefully meeting during the week, not just on a Sunday morning. See, a lot of this is just about a change of perspective, that the church is as as people are meeting and connecting in how in a multitude of different formats that we are still coming together and we're still entering into a time of celebration and worship because that's powerful and amazing. Our house of wine service in the early morning when we pray and just get into God's presence is so vital as God speaks his heart to us and, and guides us. Things shift in the town and in the region as people praise God and, and celebrate and worship and declare the truth. There's power that's released in that. So, um, so I just wanted to make that clear that we are, we're still looking forward to more and more uh, times of, of coming all together here in worship and prayer, but we're also going to be putting a lot of our resources into seeing the church community thrive and function beyond just coming and sitting in chairs and looking, you know, at the back of the head of the person in front of you, because that's not community, that's not church, you know? So, so it's, a lot of this is about shifting perspective. But I've shared in the past that we've had several visions. Uh, people separately from one another have had dreams and visions of this church having this kind of worship time where the church, the saints are gathering, but a lot of people were coming to this building from the community to go to different classes and trainings. There was like trainings after church on Sunday that people were coming 
to encounter and learn about a whole variety of topics. And so we also have, a, have this picture that God's developing in our heart of a school and a training that's going to come, come to pass that will involve spiritual stuff and even natural, you know, everyday life issues of, of you know, healthy marriages, healthy parenting, healthy, and all that kind of stuff being a resource to the community for that. And so when the church gathers to worship, that's meant to be for the church. I mean, a lot of people make the church service into this like seeker sensitive thing where we have to, um, we have to like make sure that everybody who comes through the door is comfortable and, you know, feels good and feels safe. We don't want to do anything weird. You know, we don't want to do anything too crazy. Um, but, but, that's looking at this church time as evangelism. And this is not evangelism. This is not the time to reach people. The time to reach people is 1201, or the way that I preach lately, 1211. Um, but that's the time to start reaching people, okay? So, and of course here, God's going to do stuff here in the church. But, um, but this time isn't meant to make everybody happy in the community and just, you know, and, and dumb it down and, and just, you know, you, know, you know what I'm saying, guys? Are you with me? I'm not knocking churches that do that. Jesus uses it. God bless them. But, but we really feel like when the church gathers, we need to be free to be the church. We need to be free to let the gifts of the Spirit flow, worship flow, and all that kind of stuff. And if, and if you're here and that's like uncomfortable or new to you, then we still want to be a loving community that's, that's, that can walk you through that, you know? We don't want to scare the crap out of people, but we don't want to dumb it down either. So there's this balance of being in a community together and, uh, and helping people that are new to intense worship and the gifts of the Spirit and all that stuff. But we're not going to make this time about seekers. This is time for us to gather and take communion, be the church. And then, um, and then we go out and we have all kinds of initiatives and ideas and just life-on-life -life stuff that we're going to reach people through. Does that make sense to everybody? Does it? Okay. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So... We're going to take this whole large-scale vision of a community center, an apostolic resource center. You can go ahead to the next one. Uh, we're going to take it a step further, and I want to put more feet to this thing, okay? And I want to talk specifically about how the church was originally designed to function, okay? We, we, we've talked about the big picture a lot. We've done that many times now. We did it all last week. But how does it work, right? How does it function? How, does, how do we actually grow towards that big vision? And what is the vision? The vision is nothing short of community regional transformation. That's it. I'm talking total transformation, caterpillar to butterfly reality of our community coming into the presence of God, coming into salvation and life, marriages getting healed, families being restored, kids finding Jesus, getting high on Jesus Christ all over the place instead of high on all this other stuff that's killing them. That's what I'm talking about, community transformation, regional transformation, seeing churches network together, coming together, global transformation all the way to children's homes in Haiti. That is the vision of the church of Jesus Christ. It is not to huddle in our four walls and wait for some, some mysterious spaceship to rapture us up in the sky, okay? That is not, that, that might be a book you read about Christianity, but that's not in the Bible, okay? We are here to be salt and light. So how do you grow into that? Because Jesus uses a lot of organic terminology, right? He talks a lot about growth talks a lot about vines and trees and branches. The church is organic. There is an organic growth process to it. What's happened is that man has introduced some GMOs into the process. Anybody know what GMO stands for? Genetically modified stuff. Organisms. It's modifying the DNA of the organic, natural plants or whatever it is, changing it to do something that, you know, there's some kind of budget for to, to get done. So um, we want the pure, organic growth of the church. So with that being said, we need to realize, first and foremost, we're going to look at Matthew 16 right here. The church is God's idea, Okay. Jesus said, I will build my church. 
And the gates of Hades, that's death. That's the realm of death and destruction. The gates of destruction shall not prevail against my church. You can clap about that. That's appropriate. Seriously. Like, for real. Okay? So, here's the sad fact of the matter, though. Man loves to help God out a little bit. And, uh, and sometimes that can lead to some bad fruit. Um, Abraham, we all know Father Abraham. Abraham was promised a son by God, Isaac. And uh, he didn't see it happen in the way and in the timing that he wanted. So he figured that he would help God out, right? So he lay with his concubine. He had a son named Ishmael. And that produced a whole bunch of problems for him and his family and for us today even. Um, Now, thankfully, God restored his promise to Abraham. God's mercy covers our intrusions into God's plans, our helping him out. His mercy covered it. He ended up having Isaac, but they suffered along the way with some problems. God's doing the same thing with his church. We have birthed some Ishmaels in the church over history. We have birthed some man-made structures, and we've reaped a lot of bad fruit because of it. But God is so gracious, and the Isaac church, the spirit-led butterfly church, is coming forth. And you are actually at the beginning of that. You are in a season of time of reformation, a building of the past reformation. We'll talk about that in a moment. This parallels church throughout history, what I'm talking about with Abraham. Jesus started to build a church that the gates of hell would not prevail against. He was resurrected in the first century, and he had specific blueprints and specific ways of doing that by his spirit. But after a century or two passed, Man got their hands on it, started to control the development and the future growth of it all. And what happens is, I want to explain this a little bit more, is that we introduce some worldly structures, unbiblical structures, into how the church was supposed to operate. Now, um, if you are Catholic this morning or if you are Protestant, I don't want you to worry because you will all have your opportunity to get offended, everyone. So if you're waiting... To get offended, don't worry, I will hit you at some point, okay? All denominations. So if I, don't, if I miss you, just come and talk to me. 15 minutes of talking about this stuff, we'll, we'll, I'll cover it. So, um, all right. Obviously, you know, being a little facetious here, absolutely love, I love the church of Jesus Christ across the nations. I really do. God has used it. God has tempered me down a lot and given me so much more grace for the church even in its caterpillar form. But seriously, we have to talk about this because when you survey the, the vineyards of Christianity over the earth, there's a lot of bad fruit. There's a lot of problems. And, um, and people justify that and say, well, you know, we're, we're supposed to have problems. That's why we have grace. Actually, no, grace starts to eliminate problems. <sighs> yeah, actually, grace forgives and then it heals. Grace is not just forgiveness. It's not just, oh, we're just a bunch of imperfect, broken people, and we have this messy system that's all screwed up, but thank God for God's grace. No, we're a bunch of imperfect, messy people that God forgives, and he restores into the perfected glory of Jesus, and he raises us up as a beautiful church that people actually want to flock to. (laughs) Okay, all right. (laughs) So... Let me say a few things here about history. I'm not going to go into detail. If you're interested in the materials and the research behind this, talk to me, all right? But Protestants, Roman Catholic, I'll start with the, our, our Catholic friends, um, they borrowed, the Roman church borrowed a lot of their structure, how they do things from, uh, first of all, from the Old Testament, which was an old covenant that Jesus ended, okay? There was a covenant priest system that he ended that he, Jesus took it away, and they reintroduced some of that. They also borrowed from the political system of Rome and from a lot of pagan religious temples in how they set up the church. Um, and a lot of what they created um, as far as church structure and growth was this modified DNA, genetically modified version of what Jesus and Peter the Rock had 
in mind. It wasn't the original organic structure. Now, my Protestant friends in the room, we have done a lot of the same things. We can't point the finger at Catholics because trust me, we have three fingers pointing back at us, okay? In more recent history, I could go into a lot of the stuff that Protestants held on to, but we have borrowed tremendously, the Protestant church across the globe, especially in the West, has borrowed from business models to build and structure church. We have built church around a business model. So to everybody, they expect a church to have kind of this CEO pastor. He's got his board of directors, elders, deacons, trustees, and there's certain protocols in place and certain types of meeting minutes and things that, you know, need to happen. And, and the members, you know, they pay their dues and they just call it tithes a lot of times, but they're really talking like, you know, membership dues. And then they in turn get voting rights and they get certain benefits, you know, of being a member of the body. Now, this is where it hurts a little close to home. It's nice to talk about the Catholics down the street, but when we start talking, you know, right here, I, it, I could feel the tension rise a little bit, but don't worry, we're gonna lower the tension and drive right on into this thing. It's gonna be glorious. Um, but, uh, but we borrow from business models. Now, again, Jesus uses it. We have a lot of business model structure still happening in this church, and you know what? God is gracious, his kingdom prevails, and he's using it, and he will continue to use it, but doesn't mean he's not gonna morph and change things as well. Today, we are in a time of reformation, okay? The Spirit of God is restoring the church to the original DNA that Jesus had planted with his early apostles. It's a slow process, but reformation is happening, and it's been happening since the turn of the 20th century, but it's really begun to take shape and accelerate only in the last 25 years or so. And this reformation... Uh, I put it up there so you could see it is, is often called an apostolic reformation. And it has to do with coming back to some of the foundations that the apostles laid for the church through Christ. So you, you all know about the first reformation, right? Everybody here know about the Protestant reformation? I, I hope so. I'd hope mostly it's like one of the biggest things in Western civilization history. I mean, literally secular historians will talk about the impact that the Protestant Reformation had on humanity, let alone the church, okay? The Reformation was a time when people like Martin Luther, that's where we get Lutherans, and John Calvin, that's where we get Calvinists, and we get all these, you know, offsprings of different stuff, but, but in, that these original guys, over a course of a few decades, were pioneering some new vision for the church, and they were challenging not the structure, that's what's happening in this day and age, but they were challenging the teaching and the theology. So the Reformation was a day when people were like, let's actually go back to what the Bible actually says and not just what, you know, the priest is necessarily telling us. Let's open it up. And it was actually all a return to grace. The Reformation started in the heart of people who were reading the book of Galatians and Romans. Martin Luther was impregnated by a revelation that came out of the book of Galatians, which is the grace epistle. And there was this awakening to grace. Now, that was 500 years ago, actually 499 years ago. Next year is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I think that's significant. It's a jubilee year, and, uh, and it's a significant year, 500 years since the Reformation. And God has been building on that Reformation. It didn't all happen at once. There's been centuries of people that have come after Martin Luther and John Calvin who've been reforming the church. And it's crescendoed and built up to a deeper understanding of the finished work of the cross and grace and, and, and the fullness of what Jesus did for, for all of the sons of Adam. And so the first Reformation is continuing. The church has been in a continual process of reforming its theology. Now, the Reformation, what's amazing about this is that when, as it really took off, the Reformation did affect all of society. The Renaissance came out of the Reformation. How many people know about the Renaissance? major time period, mankind, amazing advancements in science, in culture, in the arts. It was a renewal. Here's why the Renaissance is important and the Reformation even more important. Because for almost a thousand years, the world was in something called the Dark Ages. 
Now, the Dark Ages were not fun at all, okay? The level of plague and disease and war and famine during that time is just, you can't fathom it. We have horrible things that happen in our world, but um, you can't understand the level of death and barbarism and destruction that went on. There's a reason they called it the Dark Ages, okay? Now, during the Dark Ages, the church was a genetically modified organism. Now, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. I think the gates of destruction prevailed for a thousand years because the church was not the light that it was supposed to be. I'm, and I'm not just preaching out of my butt right now. This is, you can check the timelines. You can look at history and you can correlate the Reformation with a mass exodus in society, progress in society. I'm not saying it's been all roses, but it's not the dark ages. Society has progressed amazingly, amazingly. And the Reformation was a time of that change. Why? Because the church started to get healed. It started to come back to its organic, original structure. And the more the church becomes what it's supposed to be, the less the gates of hell will prevail on the earth. So, beloved of God, with this Reformation that we're in and coming into even more, you can expect a new renaissance on the earth. People are talking about, you know, the end of the world, global crash, zombie apocalypse. There's a renaissance coming. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be a rocky transition towards it, but there's a renaissance coming because there's a reformation happening. Now, it's hard. It's hard to see all of this when you're in the midst of it, right? It's hard. It's easy to open up a history book and say, and read in one paragraph from 1500 to 1600, oh, that's what all happened, and that's how theology and church changed and society. Okay, when you're in the midst of it, you have no clue, because this is spanning decades of time. It's spanning different countries and continents, and it's really hard to see. Not everybody during that time were saying, we're in a reformation. This is the great reformation. People didn't even notice it was happening, and yet it was going on all around them. In the next few weeks and in the years ahead, okay, we're going to be discussing and embodying, by the grace of God, a reformation that is going on right now. And it's been building for some decades, and it's reaching a crescendo, and it's going to continue to overflow and change society. And that reformation has to do with how we do church, okay? It's not just the wine. If you remember, we talked about this last week. There's the new wine and the new wine skin. So God has been purifying the wine. He's been purifying the message of grace, the gospel. Now the gospel needs a wine skin, a container to go in. And the old systems, the old way of doing it is just not going to cut it. I'm not saying God, again, can't use it all and doesn't use it, but there's a new wine skin that he has as dramatic, and hear me on this, okay? I want you to actually soak this in for a moment. I appreciate you all listening to me, but I want you to switch your brain into a new gear, and I want you to, like, reflect for a moment, okay? After I say this, as dramatic as the Protestant Reformation was, okay, going from the centralized Church of Rome, popes, bishops, all those things, to the Protestant Reformation that spread all across the countries of the world, as dramatic of a shift and a change that was, this Reformation is as dramatic as that to where we're at today. Just say a lot on that for a moment. So what, <clears throat> we'll give you a few more moments. Why do I say that? I say that because change is difficult for people and, and we need to recognize the nature of what's going on in the earth. There's a lot of change happening and I wanna be ready to ride the wave of that. I wanna have my arms up on the roller coaster. I'm not really a fan of roller coasters. When I get on them, I, I, I cling to dear life 
and scream. There's this picture that went out on the internet of me because somebody took it off of the, uh, they went on a roller coaster with me and they, they, they took the picture from you know, Six Flags and they put it out there when I was the youth pastor of this church and they showed it to all the kids and I looked like a maniac. I'm this terrified maniac on a roller coaster. Anyway, anyway, but in my heart of hearts, I wanna, I wanna go like this. Just, you know what I'm saying? That's what we're made for. So, so just, everybody just lift your arms for a moment. Just say, Jesus, take me on a ride. <laughs> okay. All right. Glory. Apostolic Reformation. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? I just gave you some big historical, global context of all this. Um, but what really matters is what does this mean here? What does this mean right now? How is God reforming the church? What changes are happening? What changes are coming? All right. I want to give you a key element of this. I'm just opening up the door a crack. You're just going to see in a little bit. And then next week and the weeks ahead, we're going to, we're going to totally walk into this thing. But, um, but to open it up a little bit, a lot of this reformation has to do with different gifts that God gave the church to grow and develop it. These are specific servant leadership gifts that were designed to be the backbone of the church, okay? And there's five gifts in particular that Paul mentions in Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians uh, 4.11. This is a famous verse, but this forms the heart of, of ecclesiology, which is a fancy word for the study of the church, the theology of the church, okay? Okay. Um, and how the church functions and op operates. So he gave some apostles, he gave some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So there's this apostolic gift. There's this prophetic gift. There's an evangelistic gift, a teaching gift, a pastoral gift. When these gifts are in operation and are functioning together as a team and a family, proper health and growth comes to the body. So the church is compared to the body, right? We're the body of Christ, literally, all right? These gifts are kind of like the spine of the body, all right? Now, th this is interesting. God teaches us things through creation, all right, through, um, I mean, through the heavens, through astronomy, but even through biology, God, God teaches us stuff. There are hidden mysteries and signs all over God's creation. It's beautiful. Um, this is a picture of the thoracic spine, okay, middle part of your back. This is, this is the key part of your spine that, that, that holds your ribs together. Now, your ribs house and protect vital organs, right? Things you need to absolutely grow and thrive and, and, and exist. Now, the thoracic spine has 12 parts to it, which I find interesting. Somebody pointed this out to me, a guy out in uh, Detroit who I connected with who uh, crashes cars for a living. He works for Ford, and uh, he's an engineer, brilliant guy. And they have to teach and understand about the thoracic spine, and the, it's called the T1 through 12 parts of, the, of this part of the spine. There's 12 parts of it. And he was highlighting to me how the fact that 12, for anybody who knows biblical numerology, 12 is an apostolic number. 12 is the number of God's government. I could get into all the reasons for that. That's, that's for another time. So there's 12 parts here that hold the rib, that protect the heart and the soul of the, you know, the, the person there. So God designed what's sometimes known as fivefold ministry to be in place in the body to support it and strengthen it and make sure the vital organs are protected. Now, what man has done over time is that we have minimized these gifts and we have not put them in the right place within the body. And our efforts to control things and prop up our own systems, you know, to get the body to grow, 
we have taken away the spine. Now, what happens if you take away somebody's spine? Not good, right? Yeah, there's limpness. There's, you, you, complete, you can't stand up in your full stature. I mean, let alone all the death and other complications. But, but you can't stand up into your full stature without a spine. And so these gifts bring people into the full stature of Jesus Christ. You're going to see that more in Ephesians 4 as we, as we talk about this. They also connect people to the head. What connects the head to the body? The spine, the spinal cord within the neck, right? So, so there, I just want you to see this, this biology picture God has given us in his creation to teach you something about the body of Christ, okay? The spiritual body of Christ. There is a spine backbone of the church that's called fivefold ministry. It's referred to as that because it's talking about the gift of the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, evangelists, working together not as a hierarchy, but as a team flowing in their different gifts. Now, in most churches, statistically, uh, across the world, a lot of them have a threefold ministry. Some of them have a onefold ministry, just the pastor, or they have maybe pastor teacher and sometimes pastor teacher evangelist in place. But what the Lord is doing, and He's been doing over, again, the past 25 years or so, is He's restoring the gifts of the prophet and the apostle. And in fact, the, the most, um, the, the church, the part of the church that is growing the most, and please see me if you're interested in these statistics, okay? The part of the body of Christ in the world that's growing the most right now is a part of this new apostolic reformation. They're churches that embrace apostles and prophets. Now, you don't see that as much in America. This is the church in China, and in parts of South America and India, churches that are exploding are embracing fivefold ministry. Okay? Islam right now is growing faster than Christianity. Okay? On a global scale. Why? Because in France, Muslims have seven kids and a French Christian has one kid. Okay? So this is numerical. This is, you know, the, the, whatever that term is for that kind of growth. Demographic growth, yeah. Um, so, anyway, the only part of the church that's actually, when you concentrate it, that's growing faster than Islam itself is apostolic Reformation churches. And this, that's a word they'll actually use. They're not trying to form a denomination, but they are embracing the gift of the apostle and prophet again, and they're exploding. Churches that are embracing the one-fold ministry of the pastor congregation with maybe his board in place, those churches are dying statistically across the world. But there are five-fold churches that are rising up that are embracing the gifts of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist working together to equip the saints to be the church. I've got like 10 more pages of notes up there, but I'm going to spare you this morning because I think, I think this is actually good. I had, I had a few more important things I wanted to say, but I think, I think that really just opens the door for you a little bit. I wanted to let you know about two things also, apart from the message. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of vision casting kind of stuff here in Sunday morning, so we're going to be talking about things like this. But uh, there's a book that came out uh, September of this year. Um, by uh, Chuck Pierce, Robert Heidler, that's called The Apostolic Church Arising. It's an excellent book, and it has to do with this change that's going on across the world, and, um, and it's got a lot of good teachings, especially the second section that Robert Heidler, he's a teacher, an amazing teacher of the Word. He, uh, he, he goes through some history, and he talks about fivefold church. I, I, I wouldn't say I'd follow this book by the letter of the law kind of thing. You know, you have to embrace every little thing in it. But there's a lot of good stuff that have, that, that's in it. So, um, so we bought a bunch of copies. I, I gave it to the leaders, um, and we have 12 left over. 12 left over. <laughs> and I want to lend it out, okay? Um, so if you're interested, um, I think, yeah, we have some back there. 
and just write your name down and take a book. Okay, we just have 12. You can always order this yourself. Um, but we purchased it. Maybe we'll purchase more if there's enough interest. But if this is something you're interested in, you know, you're, you feel like a call to, you know, the church, leadership and all that, I really want to recommend that you, you check out this book, okay? So we'll lend them out. You just write your name and phone number so we know, and then we'll, we'll get it. We'll, we'll make this the, you know, the journey library, okay? And, uh, and you, can, you can check that out. So, um, so there's that. The other thing I wanted to let everybody know is that when I went out to California, I connected with a ministry called Harvest International Ministry. And, um, and Harvest International Ministry is not a denomination, but it's a network of churches that embrace this apostolic reformation. And, um, and when, I, when I went out there and I came back and we prayed as an elder team, we felt like God is really connecting us with this organization. And, um, and so we have decided to, to align with them, to connect with them. And, uh, and this is really cool because we, we, as all of you know, or many of you, some of you are newer from the past year, but we disaffiliated from the Assemblies of God. So we've been operating independently, which has, you know, been fine, but we, we knew that God was going to bring relationships to us. And when Mark Isles was here uh, from England, Mark Isles, on the last day he was here, it was like, actually, he was here for two weeks, so it was probably... It was probably, I think it was the last time he was with the leaders. He was with me. He said, I really feel like God, God wants you guys to connect with apostolic leadership. It was a week later, it was less than a week later, that I got invited to go to this thing at Cheon's Church in California. So I was not even planning that. So I went out there, and, uh, and we have decided to, to partner with them. We're going to give you more information about uh, HIM, Harvest International Ministry. But what a network means is that they're just there for support. They're there for support. They're there for resources. And if there's ever a problem in the church, we're not on our own. We can actually call them to come in. If there's ever a problem with one of the leaders, there's an issue. This network is committed to coming in and helping walk through that with us. There's no legal obligation or anything like that, but there's a relationship there. So I wanted to let you know about that. I wanted to let you know about the book. And I just wanted to open a little bit of the can of worms this morning about reformation, about change. It's great to talk about all this big scale vision, but how do we work that out? Well, God showed us. It's through fivefold ministry rooted into the gospel of Jesus Christ, connected to that, always flowing from that. But there is a wineskin that God has to infuse the world with the wine of the gospel. So we're gonna talk about that more next week, okay?